In a letter dated 22 January 1870, Massini wrote to Pike. Now, Albert Pike is this high mason who wrote this, the manual, if you like, of Scottish Freemasonry. He said the following, We must allow all of the federations to continue just as they are. It must appear as things are as they were in the beginning. With their systems, their central authorities, and diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right, organized as they are at present, but we must create a super right, which will remain unknown, to which we will call those masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to our brothers in masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy, through this supreme right we will govern all Freemasonry which will become the one international center, the more powerful because its direction will be unknown. Now Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mancini and that was dated August 15, 1871 in which he propagated that there should be a world order, a one order where all nations are under the control of one central organization. And in order to achieve this, they planned, and there are numerous quotes for this, so I've put a number on the screen, because some will say, I don't trust this, I don't trust that, I don't trust the other. Here are references down there, there are references up there, there will be references in other slides, so it comes from different sources. He said, and this was, by the way, on display in the British Museum, and could be seen there until it was taken away. The First World War, to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, protector of orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communistic state. Did that happen? Yes. Now that was written long before this event. Long before this event. This was written in 1871. This war broke out in 1914. The Second World War. That's also written long before the event. To originate between Great Britain and Germany, to strengthen communism as atheist, as antithesis to the Judea Christian culture and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. Did it achieve this objective? Yes. In fact, after this war, Israel in its present form was reinstated under the protection of Britain. And then interestingly enough, a third world war, a Middle Eastern war involving, involving Judaism and Islam and spreading internationally. That's fascinating. Is that uh, on the cards, or what do you think? Certainly sounds like we are on track. Well, here's another quote, uh, just in case people don't like that quote. Massini with Pike developed a plan for three world wars so that eventually every nation would be willing to surrender its national sovereignty to a, to a world government. The first war was to end the Tsarist regime in Russia, the second to allow the Soviet Union to control Europe, the third world war was to be in the Middle East between Muslim and Jews and would result in Armageddon. Interesting. Now, how were they going to do it? Let's read what Albert Pike wrote about these wars and uh, how they were going to be uh, unleashed. He wrote, quote, We shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist. So the destroyer and the atheist. And we will provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism origin of savagery and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the minority of revolutionaries will exterminate these destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity will receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The destruction of Christianity and atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Wow, what a clever plan. So you rub the two systems which you create up against the other. You create atheism, 
as an antithesis to the Judeo Christian culture. You have these two clash until they rub each other up, and then out of that, you will get a new world order where you have a new religion which is far more esoteric and actually honors Satan. Isn't that a rather clever plan? Well, it's very successful. That is why Ordo Abkao, Ordo Abkao is the, the verse, if you like, that uh, Freemason reuses. This is one of their documents, remember, that I photographed in a Masonic lodge. True church. It doesn't exist anywhere today except in small pockets of individuals who meet with each other in Christ's name. All of these organized religions have bastardized the teachings of Christ, have corrupted the teachings of Jesus, and most of them are helping to lead you into slavery in the New World Order. In those days, great signs and wonders were performed as God confirmed His Word with signs following. True Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, anointed by the Holy Spirit, swept the world like a prairie fire. Nothing could stop it. No matter how many Christians the emperor crucified, no matter how many Christians were thrown to the animals in the Roman circus, one hundredfold sprang up to take their place. This movement encircled the mountains and crossed the oceans. It made kings tremble and tyrants fearful. And it was said of those early Christians that they had turned the world literally upside down. So powerful was their message and spirit. Now I am talking about the true Christian teachings of Jesus Christ and the way that it was followed in the early days of Christ's church. Not Rome's church, not Baptist's church, not Lutheran's church, not Orthodox church, but Christ's church. Before too many years had passed, men began to set themselves up as lords over God's people in places of the Holy Spirit instead of conquering by spiritual means and by truth, by truth, not too many people in the world understand what truth even means today. As in the early days, men began to substitute their ideas and their methods in place of the teachings that Christ gave us. The Inquisition came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. The Crusades came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. Attempts to merge paganism and Christianity were being made even in the days when our New Testament was being written, folks, for Paul mentioned that the mystery of iniquity was already at work, already at work, and he warned that there would come a falling away and some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the counterfeit doctrines of the pagans. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And by the time that Jude wrote the book that bears his name, it was necessary for him to exhort the people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For certain men had crept in who were attempting to substitute things that were no part of the original faith. Check Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Christianity, folks, came face to face with the Babylonian paganism in its various forms that had been established in the Roman Empire. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with its customs and beliefs. And we all know what happened. Much persecution resulted. Many, many Christians were falsely accused, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake, and in other ways tortured and martyred. And for their own safety, they went underground in the catacombs and in the caves. And they formed their own secret society, which was known then as the Friendly Open Secret Society. And their symbol to mark their way was a fish. Then, great change.
changes began to be made, the Emperor of Rome professed conversion to Christianity. He had to. For Rome, Rome would have fallen just as sure, just as sure as a tree in the forest falls to the axe if he had not made that move. In those early days of the real church, the real church, Christ's church, who practiced exactly what he taught them, great, great changes began to take place that have affected us right up to this very day. What a shock it must have been when Constantine professed a conversion to Christianity after stating that he had seen the vision of a cross in the sky. And some accounts say that he didn't see it in the sky during daylight, that he saw it in a dream. And ladies and gentlemen, because he never accepted Christ during his entire life, and in fact was a pagan sun worshiper, I question whether he ever saw a cross at all. You see, because history says and records very clearly that Constantine never accepted Christ as his Savior. He never really followed the teachings of Christ. He was, in fact, a sun worshiper. He practiced the mystery religion of Babylon. But he was, in fact, the emperor of Rome. Rome very quickly became, ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church, and the Roman Emperor became the Pope. He had to do this to save the Empire. The symbol of the Roman Empire and the Emperor was the double-headed eagle. It signified that he ruled over both the East and the West, that the sun did not set on the Roman Empire. This symbol still is displayed upon the walls of the Vatican. And just recently, Russia adopted this symbol as its national symbol. It is the symbol of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But hopefully, you get the point. Imperial orders, ladies and gentlemen, went forth throughout the Roman Empire that persecutions should cease simply and quickly cease. Bishops were created and given high honors. The church began to receive worldly recognition and power. But for all of this, a great, great price had to be paid. Many, many compromises were made, ladies and gentlemen, with paganism. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became a part of this world system. The emperor, showing favor, demanded a place of leadership in the church. For in paganism, emperors were believed to be gods. So from here on, wholesale mixtures of paganism into Christianity were made, especially at Rome. We believe the, the, the information that you're going to receive and have received, in fact, over this broadcast, will convince you that what is known today as the Roman Catholic Church is nothing less than the old... Roman Empire transformed and the old Roman pantheon of gods became the pantheon of saints. When Jesus spoke to a crowd and someone walked away from the crowd, he did not chase them down the road and try to stuff his teachings down their throat, ladies and gentlemen. He did not do that. Neither did he build great, wealthy cathedrals built of shining glass with great pageants on the holidays and big-name stars to come and sing and perform in these pageants where a homeless person or a poor, unemployed man with dirty clothes would be turned away from the door. Jesus Christ would have been the first one who welcomed that person into the church. And if you will look at the people that he habitually associated with, whose homes he slept in, who became his disciples, you will understand that those today who call themselves Christians do not even know the meaning of the word. You know, I am on a mission, and that mission is to slap people upside the head and wake them up and even make them hate me, if that's what it takes 
to get them to go examine what I'm telling them.